Maps have always been a huge part of the human experience now for thousands of years. The oldest map on record is the Katalhoyuk cave painting in Konya, Turkey. It's believed that this image was created sometime around 6200 BCE, which is roughly around an entire millennium before the advent of written language. And ever since then, maps have been around to help guide us to wherever we need to go, and in many ways. They determine how we think about the world around us. But as it turns out, maps can also be a massive source of myths and disinformation, including my own that you see on this channel from time to time. So, as with everything in life, you need to do your own due diligence, and here are a bunch of examples why. Back in June of 2019, an unprecedentedly long fire season began in Australia. Lack of soil moisture as well as an uncommonly long dry season led to what became a long and terrible 10 months of fires. During the height of these flames, an artist and designer named Anthony Hearsay created a 3D image of Australia. Pulling data from NASA satellites, he showed all of the places within the country that the fires had hit up to that point. And while the image was quite compelling, and relatively accurate within its intended context, the map nevertheless became a cornerstone for false information. As the image was spread across the internet as quickly as the wildfires they depicted, a Facebook page dedicated to the news of the Australian fires reposted the photo with the new caption, a 3D image of Australia shot from a NASA satellite. This version of the photo with that caption was then subsequently shared around 10,000 times. Then the apex of this mass spread of misinformation came when Rihanna tweeted the photo to her, at the time, 96 million followers. Not long after that, the image began being called out as false, leading to both Facebook and Instagram initially flagging and taking down the original post until it was all cleared up by hearsay that he never actually at any point claimed that it was a NASA satellite photo. So, it's easy to see how something like this all gets out of hand. The news coming out of Australia at the time seemed so dire, while at the same time, the image appeared genuinely compelling. And while it was a somewhat accurate 3D rendering of the culmination of all the fires up to that point, it was absolutely not what it was being hailed as. Something going viral is a great way for information to be misinterpreted or misrepresented. Back in a 2014 article for Slate, Bren Blatt talked about a popular GIF map that showed which baby names were most popular in every US state depending on the year. But he points out that while the map is technically correct, the information given isn't as straightforward as it appears at first glance. For instance, the name Ashley is seemingly the most popular name for girls across the US in the years 1991 and 92. Despite that fact, however, a child born in 1984 was 8% more likely to have been named Ashley than a child born in 1992. In fact, 1986 was the year when Ashley peaked as a name within the US. But the reason why the 91 and 92 years showed up on the map is because, as Ashley dipped in popularity as a name, other names dipped even quicker. So while this map isn't incorrect, it can easily lead to an incorrect understanding of what was actually happening at the time. Now while some of these maps we've been talking about involve misleading statistics or false information that were believed to be true at the time, cell phone coverage maps are just another thing entirely. If you look at one of the maps provided by any of the big telecom companies, you might feel confident in that fee that you're paying every month. Most of the companies show a map largely covered in different shades of the color of their choice. 4G LTE and even 5G is boasted around the majority of the US. But in 2019, the FCC conducted a study to see if cellular data was actually available in all of the places that the larger telecom companies were claiming there was. And as it turns out, it wasn't even close. The company with the highest amount of coverage was still under 65% of what it claimed on their map, with at least one company having coverage closer to around just 45% of the area that it claimed. Claimed. The FCC is doing its best to get the telecom companies to fall in line, because over-exaggerating about their coverage actually affects an even larger issue. As technology and society advances, it becomes more and more important for people to have internet access and cellular coverage. But if there's money going to be put into infrastructure, we need to actually know where there is coverage and where there isn't. And while a map that's all different shades of purple might look nice and make it seem like the company is ahead of the game, it's really just blocking access to parts of the country that might actually need it the most. But that's just business, right? Governments have never released any confusing or misleading maps before, right? Of course they have. 
After the 2016 US presidential election, the voting maps that were often shown on TV and in articles were of the country divided into red and blue sections, based on which counties voted for which candidate. If you've ever seen a version of this map before, you've seen that it's essentially just a sea of red across the country, with some blue edges and a few scattered blue dots floating throughout the center. And while within the lens of which county voted for which candidate this map is accurate, it's nonetheless pretty misleading. For instance, regardless of which election it is, painting any county a single color is often highly inaccurate. In a pure win or lose ratio, yeah, one side lost and one side won. However, if a country is only won by 1%, as has been the case with many counties across the US for the past several presidential elections, then painting that entire county a single color doesn't truly represent the entire voter bloc. If one is using the map to imply a landslide, it just isn't accurate without the peripheral data. Coloring in every county in darker or lighter shades of red or blue would dramatically help with this accuracy problem. But there's another inaccuracy inherent within this map as well. If one looks at this map alone without any outside knowledge at all, it might seem as if almost nobody in the country voted for blue, while almost everyone voted for red instead. In reality, however, the votes were much closer than this map suggests. Red received 60 62,984,828 votes, while Blue received 65,853,514 votes, which is well over 2 million more than Red. And the reason why this map fails to capture that closer spread is because it's the wrong one to use. This is a map of land, while an election map should really be a map of people. For example, if you look at the land map of the United States, you'd see that New York State and Arkansas are roughly the same size. But there's only 3 million people living in Arkansas, while there's more than 19 and a half million people living in New York. That is well over six and a half times the population of Arkansas, and those are just states with similar sizes. It gets even more bonkers when you look at a comparison of states like New Jersey and Wyoming. By land mass, Wyoming is more than 11 times larger than New Jersey, but by population, New Jersey has more than 15 times the people of Wyoming. In fact, tiny but crowded New Jersey has nearly the same amount of people as Wyoming, Utah, Idaho, Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Nebraska do all combined. But you can reduce the size comparison even further. If you focus on just nine counties around America's two largest cities, New York and Los Angeles, you'll find that the votes cast in just these nine counties were only 260,000 short of those cast in all seven of these entire states combined. And thus, if you look at a map of the United States based on where people actually live, like this one, you can clearly see a significantly more even and closer distribution of votes than the one that is based only on land. And then there's all the fake stuff that used to be included on world maps that everybody just thought was real for hundreds of years. Like these strange mountains you've probably never heard about or ever seen before called the Mountains of Kong. They were first referenced in a map of Africa by a Scottish explorer back in 1798. And over the next hundred years until almost the beginning of the 20th century, different maps continued showing this extensive mountain chain that simply never existed at all. And yet, as recently as 1995, a world atlas still referenced them being there. But the Kong Mountains aren't the only mapped geographic feature that never actually existed. There's also the Mexican island of Bermeja, which first showed up on a Spanish map back in 1539. The belief that this imaginary island existed stuck around for so long that it wasn't until 2009 that the country of Mexico officially announced to the world that it had finally been determined that the island of Bermeja doesn't actually exist. That is 470 years that some of the world believed a fake island existed, all because it showed up on one map back in the 16th century. And then, of course, there is the island of California, the famous historical misconception that the Baja Peninsula region of Mexico wasn't connected to the rest of the North American mainland. A Spanish novel from 1510 referred to a magical island named California. And so, when Hernán Cortés and his men showed up in the 1530s, they decided to name what they believed was an island 
California. By the end of the decade, however, it was actually discovered that the land was, in fact, a peninsula. But then for reasons that aren't really entirely clear, nearly a century later in 1622, maps began showing the area as an island again. And then it stayed that way across many maps for another century and a quarter. Until the King of Spain, Ferdinand VI, made it clear that California is not an island, and ordered all new maps to reflect this. However, there are still maps all the way up until 1865, the year when the U.S. Civil War ended that continued showing the Baja Peninsula as an island. And then, sometimes, maps are less accurate in order to be more helpful. For example, the map for the London Tube is pretty far off from the area's geographic reality. The Thames curves in places on the map where it doesn't in real life, and vice versa. Distances between certain stops seem minuscule on the map, but take longer than the rides between stops that look closer. Well-known stops and streets are listed in geographically incorrect places, depending on if it's above ground or below. And all of this is because of the simple fact that all of this complex geographic information needs to all fit on just a small and easy-to-read square map. And what's most important on this kind of map is to show the lines and places they connect to and end. Nobody who needs to know how to get to a geographic location should be using a map that is specifically designed for something else. But that's actually what most of us do with our world maps anyway. The most commonly used world map is called the Mercator Projection Map, named after the cartographer Gerdes Mercator, who created it centuries ago, back in 1569. Now obviously, a lot has changed since 1569, as have a lot of aspects to the map. But the core way that the map looks at the world has stayed more or less the same. And that's the problem, because the Mercator map was never initially intended to be used as a map for the common person. It was made as a map for navigators, where one could easily draw straight lines between the known ports of the world. In fact, the map was initially called a new and enlarged description of the Earth with corrections for use in navigation. It's literally right there in the name. But as the number of people traveling across the oceans increased over time, this map became more and more widely used. It also helped that the map made countries in the Northern Hemisphere seem much larger in comparison to those that were in the Southern. During the age of colonialism, it was a welcomed way of viewing the world, despite the original intentions of just being an easy way to draw a line between two points. Now, in modern times, even if the Mercator projection is the map used in classrooms, many of us have been taught and are aware about the map's glaringly obvious geographic issues. Most infamous of all is the absurdly large size of Greenland, which appears to be roughly the size as the entire continent of Africa, despite in reality only actually being just a tad smaller than the Democratic Republic of the Congo in the continent's center. Antarctica covers almost the entire bottom quarter of the map, despite being the third smallest of Earth's continents. Alaska appears larger than Australia, despite being more than four times smaller in real life, and consequently, Russia's inflated appearance has been utilized several times in the U.S. before for propaganda purposes, especially during the Cold War to create fear over the supposed monstrous spread of communism across the world. All of this distortion is due to the fact that the projection is a cylindrical map. Based on Mercator's very specific needs when he made it, the further things are from the equator, the more their size inflates. And there's all sorts of math and science regarding the hows and whys of the Mercator projection, but the bottom line is, as with most world maps, it's just hard to show an accurate portrayal of things that exist upon a three-dimensional sphere in real life on a flat, rectangular, two-dimensional picture. So, while the Mercator projection succeeds at its original designed intention, it fails at most everything else. And then, of course, there is the one thing that most global maps fail to show. North is not up, and south is not down. The Earth sits in space, and in space there is no top and there is no bottom. When looking at a map like the Mercator, it presents the northern hemisphere above the southern, when the reality is that that's all just a matter of perspective. North and south are only directions, but there is no top or bottom to the Earth, a planet. The southern hemisphere isn't below the northern, it's simply on the other side of the equator. But because it's what most of us have always known, it's easy to understand why one might consider north to be the top of the map. 
but as the south up orientation map shows, it's really just as easy to see it all the other way around. Even though to you this perspective may feel strange, it's just as accurate of a view of Earth's geography as it is the other way around. A map with the north on top isn't lying to us, but it's also not telling us the full truth. Because in the end, maps are only that, a representation of a partial truth. But you know what is a full truth? The best investment that you can make probably isn't in designing a map, but investing in yourself. As you probably know, we as people generally know what's best for ourselves, but we're pretty often unable to transform healthy behaviors into long-term habits. But that's exactly what Fabulous is here to help with. Fabulous is an app rooted in behavioral science that helps you build and maintain healthy habits. You can either do this all a la carte by telling the app what specific habits you want to build, or go through one of their curated journeys, which collect a number of habits together to help you achieve an overall goal. For example, I enrolled in an unexpected journey to help me out with feeling more energized, which begins really easy by just making sure that you're drinking enough water when you wake up, and then builds on from there. It's pretty much just like having your own personal coach inside of your pocket, and it breaks down scientifically proven healthy habits into small tasks that you can easily achieve every single day. So whether you want to improve your sleep, your concentration, your diet, your self-discipline, or any one of plenty of other habit changes, Fabulous can help you do the work you need to do, and when you get a premium membership, you're able to add unlimited habits in your routine, you unlock all journeys, and you unlock daily coaching content that will help you stay motivated. And starting is easy because the first 100 people to click the button that's on screen right now or heading down to the link below in the description will get 25% off of a fabulous subscription. It's a great way to improve your habits and help support real life lore at the same time. And as always, thank you so much for watching.